I'm here to kick off the innovation session and I thought I would just start um, with a bit of a national context about what we're doing um, for some of our biggest threats um, and the way we primarily do that is through GIA. We've heard about that a lot today. It was in the Kahoot quiz so everyone hopefully knows it's government industry agreements. So we wouldn't have a, a biosecurity KVH or KiwiFruit biosecurity symposium without some reflection on PSA. Um, and I think it's really important because we need to know where we came from, um, some lessons learned so that we can do it better for the future. Um, and I think for people who were here during PSA, probably the boomers, I imagine, were around then. Um, <laughs> Some of the reflections would probably be along the lines of um, that at the start of the response between government and industry, there was a little bit of misalignment that um, they operated in silos um, and some of those decisions maybe were a little bit slower than they could have been um, or maybe they weren't as aligned as they could have been um, because they didn't really have a good relate or not, they didn't have a good partnership prior to um, PSA. And John touched on in crisis, it's really not the best time to be making these partnerships because um, people are stressed out and vested interests kind of pop up quite a lot. Uh, this was also reflected in an official kind of formal review of the PSA response to get some lessons out. And it, it says pretty much the same thing. The initial response of PSA was led by um, MPI and in effect Zespri or the industry. And it was quite apparent there that there were dual responses ongoing instead of a single coordinated one. Um, and that's where um, the strength of GIA comes in. It really tries to fill this gap. So it tries to formalise these partnerships between government and industry in peacetime. So then when we do come across a response, touch wood, um, that we can all hit the ground running together and kind of um, save some of that time at the start about trying to align on what we want to achieve. So if you look at um, GIA, KVH was the first um, signatory back in 2014, so we're kind of almost looking 10 years on from, from when we first kicked it off, and you can see it's growing leaps and bounds. The last, or the latest signatory was actually earlier this year, so that means that you know almost 10 years on, people are still really seeing the value in this framework and this initiative and wanting to get on board. Um, one of the real strengths of GIA is not only does it bring government and industry together, but it brings industries across the board closer together as well. So up here we have um, some livestock sectors as well as some plant sectors. Um, and it's one of the only forums where all those kind of parties can get together to discuss things, um, which is really awesome. We do work a lot closely um, or a lot closer with um, the horticultural sectors. Most are found on the left here. Um, and that's because we share some of those biggest threats that um, impact us all. And we know that um, we need to do it together to be stronger together. So um, this is a great way that we can all align um, and get some progress going to prepare us nationally. So I thought I'd just touch on some of the, um, the councils or, um, that KVH is involved in. This isn't all of them. Um, I only have 10 minutes, so I thought I'd just pick a few out. Um, but there are other areas that KVH is involved in as well. So we're part of Plant Pass and Plant Council and, and some governance um, groups. So um, these are some of our biggest risk threats nationally. So I thought I would just briefly go over and touch on some of the research priorities that are coming um, out of these councils and networks that we're working on. So if we start with BMSB, um, I'm sure it's everyone here knows it. And if you don't, pick up our most unwanted poster outside. Um, and if I just look at some of the priority areas that we've been, been working on, um, this council's been set up since 2017 and we've recently renewed again. So it shows that real interest in keeping this work going. It has about 10 signatories, so government and then nine plant sectors um, involved as well. So it's got a really wide reach. So if we look at early detection, from the start we've been um, doing these public awareness campaigns and probably some of you have seen some of the work that, um, or some of the awareness that we put out there. A lot of stuff um, now is online, so there's lots of Facebook ads, there's lots of TV ads that get people aware of BMSB and that's because the pathways into New Zealand, um, a lot of them have human um, aspects to them. So if you think of passengers and mail, um, that has a really key human part to it. So if those people know what to look out for, they'll be able to um, detect it and hopefully report it. And there's a lot of focus on those key groups. So gardeners, that's where um, BMSB will likely be found. So getting them aware of what it looks like. Um, we also have a surveillance program that operates. Um, I won't talk about it because everyone listened to my demo station and knows all about it. Um, but that's operating through the council and it will continue. 
Uh, if we look at response, um, keeping the response tools going and keeping the tools in our toolbox is really important. Um, so recently we just got a reassessment of um, bifenthrin, which is a key chemical that we'll use, which means that it's still available to us to use should we need to. Um, and kind of a renewed focus or um, a focus that's taken hold lately is this triggers to long-term management. Um, and that's really important because um, as we move and should we um, decide that a response is no longer feasible, we want that movement into long-term management to be as smooth as possible. We want everyone to be on board for it. So when industry you know, takes a gambit and it gets handed over to us, it'll be the smooth process. No one's dropped the ball and we don't have to pick anything up. So it's a really key part of what we're working on alongside um, BNZ at the moment. And then Samurai Wasp. Um, the council was a really um, integral part of getting that approved in the first place through EPA back in 2018. And since then, we've just been really looking at how we can get the WASP here, how we can get it in the numbers we need it. So should we get in a BMSB, we have the tool in our toolbox to release and use and optimising its use. How many do we need? How far can they fly, etc. So if we go to the Fruit Fly Council now, um, it looks like it's, it's a lot less going on, but I guess that's just a reflection that it's a much um, more mature program. So we've been doing fruit fly a lot longer. We have a proven surveillance network and proven response tools. We've caught uh, fruit fly before and we've eradicated it. So we know what we've got works. So what we're currently focusing on in this space is refining what we have and creating efficiencies in the system. So um, one of the key things we're looking at, and I think Nick touched on it, um, or someone asked him a question about it, is this automated trapping system. So having these traps out there, um, less laborious, less manual labour, and it kind of can potentially give you a real-time indication of when you get a fruit fly in a trap. So a fruit fly comes in, all the science goes in behind it, pings it to your phone potentially, and then you know that you need to go check that trap um, a lot quicker than you usually would. So we have been um, trialling these in our network. Um, we had about 60 last year, and we're looking to increase that year, this year to try and get its efficacy and how it'll work. Um, and then relationship building with Australia. So Nick touched on this. We share the same challenges. Um, you know, we can share lessons learned. Matt's been over there as part of um, Fruit Fly Council as their chair um, to start building that relationship and... Um, you know, avoiding that duplication and trying to align where we can so we can um, be better together in our little corner of the world. Um, Lepidoptera, so moths and butterflies. This is our newest kind of working group or um, yeah, group under uh, the GIA, and it's, it's really early on. So you look at fruit fly that's been going, you know, since the beginning, really, and then you look at Lepidoptera, and we're kind of coming up to our first year of work that's coming out of it. So a lot of these priorities are really focused on understanding the risk. It's not, we're not at the stage yet where we need to, um, or where we can look at management tools and things. We're still trying to figure out um, where our risk is and how we can prepare for it. So part of that is um, we're looking to group some species. So we know there's about 200,000 or more Lepidopteras out there. Um, and we know through our GIA members that there's about 30 to 40 really high risk priority species um, for those in Involved. So we can't do, um, you know, work on 40 species. So we're looking to try and group these so that we can undertake some work that covers a whole range of species. More bang for your buck um, and getting some generic readiness work going underway for those guys. Um, and stakeholder engagement is a really important one. Um, Lepidoptera, it will be a wider than just an industry pest. So um, it could potentially um, go into the native estate or other areas. So we're wanting to engage those stakeholders early on to make sure we're all on the same journey in this space. And then lastly, I thought I would just finish on what we're doing as a kiwi fruit industry. Um, and that is, I talked a little bit about it yesterday if you were here, but we have um, a sector specific um, sector OA that we work closely with BNZ um, with. And these are organisms that are kiwi fruit specific. So they don't necessarily have a national um, flavour to them because we're the only industry that will likely be impacted or known to be impacted at this stage. So how do we manage those and what are um, some of our key priorities for our work program going ahead? Um, Threat readiness manuals, I've talked about it, but this is really just a way that BNZ and um, Kiwi Fruit can be on the same page um, with all the information that we have and the tools we have. It's just a really good way to collate everything we know so everyone's on the same page and can hit the ground running. 
um, enhancing our surveillance. This is quite key. We're looking at um, um, in desperate innovation, and it might be talked about, so I won't steal their thunder, but we're looking at surveillance and enhancing it. So in this space with BNZ, we're looking to really capture some of their knowledge about um, diagnostics and s symptoms and management possibly, and create some tools for the industry so that we can hand them out and get more people reporting, getting um, them to understand what happens um, and try really enhance that system. And then lastly, um, building capability. So if you were here yesterday, Exercise Tracy, that was done under um, our Kiwifruit Sector OA. So that was done in partnership with BNZ to try and increase the capability um, across our networks um, in the industry to build that confidence because we know in a response um, we're going to be calling on a lot of people in the industry to come give us a hand. So if we can get everyone a little bit more prepared and a bit aware of how that will work and what that might mean, then it means, again, we kind of don't lose that time at the start trying to get um, everyone up to speed and everyone can jump in. So that is me. Thank you.